Real Chat episode 32, Clue. Every person in this room has the perfect motive. Stand back! For murder. What do you mean? Murder. But only one of these suspects is the murderer. Is it the timid Mr. Green? Why are you screaming? Because I'm right out what? Screaming! Or the militant Colonel Mustard? If I was the killer, I would kill you next. Huh? Except if. If. Mrs. White, who helped her husband on his way. Well, it's a matter of life after death. Now that he's dead, I have a life. Ah! Miss Scarlet, who's helped many men along the way. Practice makes perfect. Huh. Professor Plum, who's looking for a way. I'm looking, I'm looking. Mrs. Peacock. I have absolutely no idea what we're doing here, but I am determined to enjoy myself. Or did the butler do it? No. Nah. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nah. Paramount Pictures invites you to an evening of mystery. Let us in, let us in, let us out, let us out! Murder. This is getting quite serious. And madness. <laughs> in the movie that makes a scene of the crime. So get it! Clue. It's not just a game anymore. Everybody, welcome to episode 32 of Real Chat, a podcast that promises week in, week out, the real world as we know it. Today we're looking at 1985's Clue, or Clue the Movie, the first film ever made based on a popular board game. The film is a murder mystery set in a gothic revival mansion and is styled after Murder by Death, which also featured Clue star Eileen Brennan. And other various murder dinner parties of mystery, including the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which also starred Tim Curry. In keeping with the nature of the board game, in theatrical release, the movie was shown with one of three possible endings, with different theatres receiving each ending. My name is Adam Stolfo, and I'm joined here as usual by co-host Bro Savard. Bro, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm very well. It's nice to get off the sci-fi fantasy track we seem to have been on on Real Chat for a while, and look at just... A really great, fun, incredibly well-made and brilliant film. A lot of nostalgia for this film. I remember we had a dodgy VHS version we'd pull out and watch uh, repeatedly. And, uh, yeah, it's just a good, fun film. And it's also one of those ones that slipped through the cracks for a while. It was hard to get a hold of for a long time in Australia. So, yeah, it's good to have a look at it now. And it's 30th anniversary this year. Yeah, mm. that's correct. And uh, joined here as well by good friend Andrew McCaskill. Andrew, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, yeah, just reiterating what uh, Bruce is saying. Just a very different film after what we've been doing the last few uh, few weeks. So nice to just tackle a different genre and a different, uh, different tone altogether. And uh, making his debut on uh, Real Chat, uh, another member of the Avard family. Yeah, exciting. Well, we, we had uh, we had Old Man Stolfo on a couple of weeks ago. We did, and uh, I thought I'd get into a bit of the family action. Yes, so, uh, Roddy Avard. Right, hi. welcome. How are we? Very well, thanks, mate. How are you Sorry. doing? I'm very good. I'm That's good. By. I'm doing what I do. This is an episode of our Vintage Vault Retrospective Series, a conscious effort to tie in selected shows with something of relevance to the present. And as you brought up up the top, bros, uh, 30th anniversary this year, 1985. It was a cult classic. It wasn't a massive hit at the cinema, but it's been huge on VHS after that and television. We have no Blu-ray in Australia. If, blu- or at all. No. Yeah. We have to go to the US to find a, um, a, a Blu-ray a, a version. Blu-ray copy of yeah, That's Clue. a pity. That's it. So, well, yeah, what are some of your initial thoughts on, on this film, guys? And also, whether or not, being based on the very popular board game, whether or not uh, you guys were fans of the game, and how you felt that this film version... I, I vaguely remember there being a copy of the board game somewhere. Where was it? Down at Nans? Nans down, down at Nans? Not all the bits, but enough to carry I, on. I think that's the nature of the game Cluedo, which is the Australian uh, name of, the, of Clue. America it was released as Clue. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it was Cluedo. I think that was the nature of the game. No one had all the bits. There was always a couple of weapons missing. I <laughs> vaguely remember substituting in maybe a Star Wars gun because the revolver was missing. I don't know. You'd, you'd just Or a bit of string for the rope. There was always something missing out of the... Because that was the great thing, I think, for, about this game is that it had kind of toys in it. It had the replicas, as well as having the cards. For some reason, it had the... They didn't need the replicas of the weapons, but they were there too. So that was, I remember that was there exciting. was little die-cast versions of the weapons. There were die And then there were the plastic version. I remember being disappointed in opening a new Cluedo box once and finding that we had the plastic versions. Oh, disappointment. The disappointment in the Stolfo the house. Oh, I'll tell you what. Wow. You have no idea. <laughs> I think... Uh, <laughs> he hit over the head with a candlestick over that one. <laughs> <laughs> Adam killed the Cluedo board game with a chainsaw in the living room, I think. <laughs> <laughs> It's just overkill, yeah. overkill. So yeah, what, what do you guys? I'll, I'll start with you, bro. This this film. 
this film? Like, what, what, what are your initial thoughts? I was, I, I'm not surprised, but excited to see Landis had a big hand in this film. John Landis gets a writing credit for the story and gets an executive producer credit, I believe, yeah. as well. It's very similar in tone to the American Werewolf in London in terms of the pacing of the film. It's a slow build. They spend a lot of time building the um, the characters and establishing those characters and giving the characters their own unique traits in the first act of the film. And then the humour kind of pays off later. And it was really nice to have that kind of bubbling underneath and then have the payoffs come um, the more you got through the film. And at the end of the day, and we'll talk about a little bit more about this in the cast, no doubt, Tim Curry is the star of this film and oh, yeah. he is phenomenal. I couldn't imagine anyone else playing him in in this instance. The energy he brings, the, the credibility he brings, and he's just hilarious. What about yourself, uh, Rod? I thought it was a great lot of fun. Six murders, what's not to enjoy? <laughs> it, it is, it's just good fun. It feels like it's meant to be a Broadway show instead of a movie, which I caught when I watched it again yesterday. Like Bro said, Tim Curry, it's just, he just sells it. He just, you can see that he's, in, you can see all the main actors are enjoying every scene they do, even if it's just a silly slapstick scene or. It definitely, it definitely reeks of a film where there's just some good, solid actors having great fun. Yeah. And they, I assume, shot it relatively quickly, but just had a ball, yeah. Yeah. A lot of times in movies now, when you get a cast movie like this, you can see the characters are having, the actors are having fun, but you can sort of see the actors coming out through their characters, like breaking character. You can, they don't sell it as well, whereas Christopher Lloyd is always Professor Plum, but you can see him enjoying being... Professor Plum. Exactly, like, yeah. They've got that... They're drawn to it. They they never break. They're character. embodying those characters the whole exactly time. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to, you know, like uh, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man is just Robert, Robert Downey, Downey Jr. Jr. Where, yeah, absolutely. Or spot if on. I'd ever bring myself to watch Grown Ups, I'm pretty sure it's just Adam Sandler hanging out with his mates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't need to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it's going to be about, isn't it? <laughs> and what about yourself, Andrew? Thoughts on Clue? I think I'm going to be the miserable uh, curmudgeon in this one. Uh, everyone seems to love it. And and, uh, and and for me, I loved this film as a kid. Really enjoyed it. And it just uh, when it was on TV, always make an effort to see it. But just seeing it uh, again recently, it just didn't really work for me this time. I really struggled with it and... I found it a little bit boring. It was just one of those, yeah, it just didn't, didn't work for me, which is strange. I was kind of looking forward to seeing it again. I, I, I found, found it a bit strange in that it's not outright hilarious and it's not suspenseful. So it's kind of this in-between kind of film for me and it's just a, a bit of a talk fest. Okay, that, that's interesting because those couple of points that you're bringing up is working against it. I think work in its favour for me personally. Yeah. So. Yeah, and yeah. That's, a, that's kind of that American Werewolf in London feel where it's not it's not gag a minute stuff. It's not bang 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 with the jokes or Even anything. Even Ghostbusters is like that. Indeed, yeah. And I, I think the advantage we have, or at least the advantage I had of watching it, is that I've only ever seen the film with the multiple endings. And for me, the slow build of the film that's where the payoff is. Tim Curry in those multiple endings is the laugh out loud moments. That wouldn't be laugh out loud if we didn't have such a slow build of some of those characters early on. So I think I'd be disappointed if I'd seen this film just with one ending, um, yeah, which, which happened on theatrical releases, apparently. So I, I hadn't seen yeah. it for a really long time. One thing I noticed on the, on the viewing this time was just how some of the great dark humour that this mm. film's got. Like yeah. Some of it's very, very dark. <laughs> Yeah. Particularly when they're starting to you know, prop up the dead bodies and try and make... Yeah, make, I mean, just the uh, moment alone when they discover Yvette dead on the pool table and they all just kind of look in and like, ah, oh, another one. Okay. <laughs> and then walk out again. It is hilarious. It's great. It's great. Um, I also found, because I watched this film earlier in the year because it was on Netflix, but then with watching it with Roddy last night and because we're both easy laughers, just having the laughter in the room helped the film. And if you get a couple of laughs in because you're with a, an audience or something early, I think you'll enjoy the film more. Whereas if I watched it on my own, I think I'd be in that position where I'm not enjoying it as much I'm analysing too much but when I sat back a bit and just enjoyed it as a film and had someone to laugh you, along with it, it it was definitely a lot more entertaining for me do you think a lot of comedies can fall into that definitely and that's the danger with comedy and I'd go as far to say that like a big dumb action film I much prefer to watch with an audience as well because so you're a lot more forgiving because you're a part of a group and you're all enjoying it together and I think this film definitely benefits from having 
an audience. And because it's got that theatrical feel, it really can talk to an audience directly, I think. It's interesting you say that because like, I was on a plane and I was watching Adam Sandler's Click. And I, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was the guy next to me laughing or it was the altitude, but I actually found that quite funny. So maybe it's just well, there a, you go. Because yeah. I struggled to laugh at that film, but maybe I need to get on a plane yeah. and watch it with some yeah. Ascend at a great height. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've always found taking Adam Sandler's films and dropping them from a great height might help. But, uh, <laughs> maybe not in the viewing. Clue was Paramount's first adaption of a now current Hasbro property, though at the time Cluedo was owned by Waddington's and licensed in the United States as Clue. To Parker Brothers. To Parker Brothers, yep. Yeah. Hasbro later bought both Waddington's and Parker Brothers, and this as well uh, predated the 19-year Paramount deal to distribute other films and television series based on Hasbro properties. So Cluedo was invented in the UK, a guy named Anthony E. Pratt, uh, developed in 1944 and he applied for a patent. He then sold it to Waddington's in, I think, 1947 and that was released by Waddington's in the, United, in the UK sorry, in 1949. The American distribution rights were sold to Parker Brothers in 1949 as well and was released at the same time under the name Clue. The reason of, for the two different names is that Cluedo is a combination of the words Clue and Ludo, Ludo being Latin for I play. And the reason they use Ludo in that title is to reference the game Ludo, which you may know from when you were a kid. It's an old English game, which in the United States was called Parcheesi. So they're actually riding off the back of the success of Ludo by putting Cluedo, putting, putting that, that, na- that word in the back of the name of it, which they couldn't do in the United States because in the United States they'd never heard of Ludo. They only knew Parcheesi. And they weren't called call it Cluecheesy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately, that would have what they would have done if they wanted to write off the back of that that previous um, success, which I assume Ludo was sold through Waddington's as well. So that's why we have the two different names. Interestingly, in Australia, it's Cluedo, but some of the changes to the game for America are what we have as well, which I found kind of interesting. Um, Reverend Green is the big one. It was Mr. Green in the U- United Kingdom and then Reverend Green in the United States and here. Yeah. Whereas, uh, and coming back to the movie, which I never really understood, Mr. Body... In the film, that is the name of the victim in the in Clue, the American version, whereas in the UK and Australian versions, it's Mr. Black. Yeah, I read about that too. Yeah, so yeah. I never really understood, except that it was a clever pun or joke that Mr. Body becomes the body, which is the same joke they use, but that's the, yeah, the American version's uh, yeah. name of the victim. <laughs> Originally, Anthony Pratt had titled the game, Murder! Which I don't see rushing off the shelves, uh, going <laughs> into homes... <laughs> What would you like for Christmas, Tommy? Murder! <laughs> it's very bizarre. Or in the United States, murder cheesy. No, not at all. Okay. For whatever reason, the board game experience really hasn't had much of an impact on cinema, uh, particularly in comparison to the video game, comic book, or literature-based pictures, which you'd no doubt agree that you know, three categories that absolutely define the movie landscape. Um, Clue is the most successful and recognisable of the few board game movie adaptions. It's a fun and faithful screen telling of the favourite party game. and It's a blast to watch and it's really quite a breeze to sit through as well. It's also smarter and more mysterious than audiences might expect as it goes along as well. I think these are all key components to why it does connect. That's quite a cult following, this movie. Massive cult following. Yeah. Didn't, didn't, well, I'm sure we'll get into it, but didn't do yeah. much business at the box office. But About to get into that, yeah. yeah. Clue is a Paramount Pictures, the Goober Peters Company, Polygram Filmed Entertainment and Debra Hill Productions release. It was released on the 13th of December 1985 in the U.S., and the 10th of April, 1986 in Australia. Pretty standard for the 80s, bros. Pretty standard. It was shot primarily at Paramount Studios in Los Angeles, California in the US, with a budget of an estimated $15 million. Wow, okay. But here's the key thing. It grossed $14,643,000 in the US. And although there aren't any figures for its international release, my understanding is it didn't do very well. So... Yeah, it didn't even gross its budget in the US. Mm. It's an interesting thing too, and we've talked about it before at length as well. This film did massive business on VHS, and the movie industry hadn't yet adapted to the idea that you could make secondary profit in a big way. So it's probably even in only in the last 10 years that studios looked less at the original American theatrical release profit as the profit and are now looking at international profit and are now looking at video or DVD release profit as a contingent of the the main profit. And I guess because the that old argument that entertainment spread more over more media and more areas now and profits less for a theatrical release. But 
this film would have been a success if VHS rentals and sales had been taken into consideration, I would, I would argue. But is it also a thing of, like, if you're a fan of the board game, then that, that, that's really, you're kind of isolating yourself a little bit by making a film about a board game, so you're really tapping into the people who are fans of the board game. I mean, if you don't, like, I, I haven't played Clue, so I, I probably wouldn't go and see a film about Clue as a result. Um, so is, is that, I mean, narrowing their, uh, their options? Yeah, I would say that choice of cast is kind of protecting them a little bit there. I mean, the game had been around for 36 years at this yeah. point. So it's not... It's, it's an element of popular culture by now. So you, you're probably right there, but it, and probably why it did better on VHS. If you marketed it on the board game, then, yeah, bang, only the board game fans. But if you marketed it on a black comedy murder mystery movie, that would broaden who would maybe like yeah. to go and see it as well. Based on the Parker Brothers or... The other joint. Waddington. Waddington. That's kind of like a Murder on the Orient Express kind yeah, of vibe, yeah. Yeah, yeah like... Uh, and uh, as you it. said, there are a couple of films already uh, that have been released along a similar line. The Peter Falk film... What did you mention at the top of the episode? So, oh, Murder by Death. Oh, Murder yeah, by yeah, Death. Yeah, yeah. 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 Murder by Death. That's a great yeah. title. <laughs> yeah, which is another yeah black comedy. Wasn't that on The Simpsons? I think it was Murder by <laughs> Death. I'm McClure. You can remember me from Murder by Death. <laughs> <laughs> and Alice's Adventures Through the Windscreen. Get the, confident, stupid. <laughs> the, um, and the president's neck is missing. <laughs> Yeah, at this point, Tim Curry is not a massive marketable star by any means either. So, The uh, director of the film is Jonathan Lynn. He's an English stage and film director, producer, writer and actor. He is known for directing comedy films such as Nuns on the Run, My Cousin Vinny, The Distinguished Gentleman, Greedy, Sergeant Bilko, Trial and Error, The Whole Nine Yards, The Fighting Temptations and Wild Targets. Oscar winning, my cousin Vinny. Yeah, it is. It's an Oscar winning. I know. Film that one, absolutely. Oh, they're, they're, just credit it correctly then. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean that to sell that, right? That's but, right. Uh, yeah. he's, he's also known for co creating and um, co writing the TV series Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. Exactly, yeah. Wow. Great, great, two great series, or one great series with two names, or however you want to look at it. Yeah. So he's a um, well, well established uh, comedy uh, director based on his um, his filmography there. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think of his uh, his work in this film? I, it's hard to tell, and I would say we've already talked about it. The very theatrical nature of this is obviously a result of having Jonathan Lynn directing it, and I think it's the work he's done with the actors in rehearsal and on set that have made such a unified feeling of these characters because when you think about it they're all strangers when they get to the house within the context of the film but they develop a chemistry very quickly and i'd say jonathan lynn had a, a, a very strong influence with that uh he also wrote the screenplay yeah did we mention that yeah we're gonna get into that yeah that um, yeah but one of the things i love about this is that the main cast the main seven actors all have their own little unique idiosyncrasies and he's allowed them to do them and they don't make a lot of sense like Madeline Kahn and um, Michael McKean especially have their own little idiosyncrasies all the way through that are very very funny that you not necessarily a, a, all directors would let them do that you know it's like they'd want something a little bit more um, mainstream or a little bit more broad but it, so it's really tasty so it's, uh, his direction I think is quite good but I'd say more is a, he's more of an actor's director than a uh, cinematic director, which is something that uh, Andrew can do. I was just yeah. going to ask Andrew about that. Do you think that that works against this film for you personally? Is that I don't think it's it's hard to imagine it going any other way. Like it's because th- that this kind of genre where you know you know have uh, got an ensemble in a focused location is so going to be and that fast feel that French it's fast. Feel. It's a flat thing, yeah. like uh, visually. So it's like how do you make that cinematic? How do you change it up? It's pretty hard. And I think he does a really good job. I mean, it's it's all about the characters. It's all about uh, the house and the, the space that, that they, they run through and it, and it really does play out like it's on stage you know especially that whole amazing sequence at the end with Tim Curry explaining the, the way everything unfolds it's, it's like a musical uh, how he moves around and um, that, that all works really well I, I, I would have liked to see maybe like Alfred Hitchcock try and tackle something like this you know I think he'd, he'd give it a really interesting take and it kind of reminds me of rope in some ways you know it's kind yeah, of it does, have a, it does have a rope feel yeah 
I just got told about rope a few days ago. I never heard about it. And then someone told me about it. I'm like, I reckon Bryce has that. And I might have to watch it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, completely yeah. different tone, but it's it's a similar kind of vibe. Um, Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Jimmy Stewart. So, yeah. You know, you've got to love that. Uh, yeah, I'm wrong. wrong. <laughs> Sorry, had, had to slop it in. <laughs> Is that Jimmy Stewart playing a seagull? Was that what you were talking about? <laughs> Last time you said it was a parakeet. Oh, there you go. <laughs> some bird, some bird of some It's getting better. <laughs> I told him, bro, it's one impersonation per episode. You have, yeah. you have a very high esteem for <laughs> seagulls over parakeets. <laughs> They're a beautiful bird. They are, they are. It's true. The film was written by John Landis and Jonathan Lynn. They, go, they both get the story credit. And then the screenplay goes to uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Lynn, Lynn. And Anthony E. Pratt gets the uncredited uh, for the board game. Oh, That's there you right. go. Yeah, right. For characters. Yeah, but, uh, but Landis. I mean, we spoke about him in great depth when we looked at uh, American Werewolf in London. He, he apparently developed the, uh, the the multiple ending idea for this film. Right? Yeah, that, that does feel Landis, doesn't it? That's uh, kind of where the film, like I said, that's where the payoff is. And without that one little element, then the film kind of, yeah, isn't as interesting all of a sudden. I think, I, I think the writing is a, is a big strength. In Definitely. The it's very well written. Yeah. yeah. Very tight. Andrew, the uh, cinematographer of Clue is uh, Victor J. Kemper. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> Can't say I, I had a chance to have a look at any of his other filmography or anything like that. So what, what have you... Yeah, well, it's a name that you don't... It doesn't jump off the page. No. Um, but in, looking into his career, he's been... In, again, he's been involved with a lot of really cool films and, and varied uh, genres. So uh, he's, he's done a lot of varied genres. Um, a lot of classic comedies of the 80s, like uh, Vacation, National Lampoon's Vacation, and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, yeah. And then he's mixed it up with like Dog Day Afternoon, which is a classic of the 70s. Amazing, yeah. And Coma, I don't know if anyone's seen Coma which is a really creepy uh, film set in a hospital, really, really beautifully shot, really moody. And The Candidate with Robert Redford, which is wow. a great flick. Um, so it really, he's been around. He's done a lot of cool stuff. Beethoven and Tommy Boy and, wow, just an incredible career, this guy. <laughs> Jingle All the Way, I think, Jingle is uh, the one that we... And uh, yeah, this. the last two projects he worked on, American Pie Presents Bandcamp, director video, and Bring It On, All or Nothing, director video. So, you know, it's, it's good bits and bad. Yeah, I think he's like, he's a... Well, he's a bit of a workman like DOP. I mean, it obviously hasn't been uh, celebrated for his visual flair or anything like that. But, you know, watching the film, it, it looks great. It, if it was done today, this film, I think it would be really overly lit and clean and dull. Um, you can imagine how they'd do it now. But it really, it, it, it just feels believable. The house itself doesn't have any bright primary colours in anywhere. Any of the it feels rooms. lived in, the, it feels the atmospheric. They come from the characters' costumes. Yeah. yeah. Particularly like Miss Scarlet's bright green dress and uh, Mrs. White's dressed in black. The other thing too, I think, uh, the temp- yes. temptation with this film now, and I think even going down the Hitchcock path, would be to overshoot it. You know, lots of crane shots. And I don't think it is handheld, but it has a handheld feel, this film. Yeah. Which is really nice. But I think if you, if you had too many flourishes from the camera and too much movement, Again, it'd take you out of the moments and the, and the comedy of it. And I think, you know, that Fincher or Hitchcocky, lots of movement, lots of special shots. Creating space. Yeah, it might yeah. be too much for this film. It's the intimacy that. Well, I think really it's very it. aware of what its limitations are. It's, yeah. you know, it's a stagey concept. And, you know, there's those great little se- sequences where they, they're all kind of separated and they're going through, uh, going upstairs into the attic or into the, into the, the um, cellar. And it creates, it does create space. It creates this feeling of this epically massive house. You know, there just is endless with endless amount of rooms. And, you know, the murderer could be lurking in one of those corners. And it, it just works. It's, it's very clever. Yeah, yeah, it's very remember, intimate. The first time I saw this film, I was convinced that the murderer was some unseen character that you never saw throughout the course of the, um, the film. Yeah, it's definitely like possible. It was just somebody else, like, you know, but that... I guess I, you, you watch it differently now as an adult, but as a kid, because all you saw was shots of the gloved hand all the time. Yeah, yes. I always just thought it was just like some unknown person. Well, murder someone was, murder she wrote style. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah definitely. So the murderer certainly shops at the same shop that the murder she wrote murderer shops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we need to find a place in between where Clue is and Cobbett Cove, who sell those gloves. Yeah, and they're like all over it. Sold for the world. That's done. right. We should have been policemen. Yeah. We should have. All we need to do is find a receipt. Yep. That's all we need. <laughs> a Black receipt. leather gloves. <laughs> Just their lodger book. Well, let's anyway. speak, uh, Bruce, about the iconic cast, and I think that this cast, you could definitely say, is iconic. 
oh, I mean, the names in this are just yeah. incredible. The cast easily falls into character. Every single actor brings obvious energy and enthusiasm to their parts, all of them hemming it up and having a grand old time, overacting and overreacting, getting into the mood and never forcing the performances. Now, the main title sequence, bros, decides to list the cast alphabetically rather than, say, of... Order of uh, appearance or, 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 or... relevance, yeah. I guess. So we're going to follow the same thing. So... First actress we're going to look at is Eileen Brennan, who plays Mrs. Peacock. So she's the wife of a senator who has accepted bribes to deliver her husband's vote. However, she claims she's innocent and she must pay blackmail money to avoid the story being used for a political witch hunt. What are your opinions on Eileen Brennan? She's great in this. She's so good. And one of the things I think that highlights how good she is, well, there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this episode, so so be it. In one of the false endings, it's revealed she's the murderer and she takes her glasses off and just shifts completely. Yeah. And she's such a bumbling kind of bitty of a character throughout the film. At that moment, you're like, oh, she, you know, you realize she's acting because she then does a completely different turn. And I, I think that highlights how great she is in this film because you kind of see her as this mousy, kind of bumbly, almost kind of old lady kind of feel. And then she, yeah, she switches it up. At the dinner party start, she just comes across as an arrogant, know it all, sour old lady. Yeah. Turned off straight away. <laughs> Hope you die. Uh, like Professor Plum. You know. yeah. I love the way she tries to break the ice in the dinner scene at the start as well, where she yeah. just talks and talks. She's very talks. nervous and yeah. chatty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, someone's got to break the ice, and it might as well be me. I mean, I'm used to being a hostess. It's part of my husband's work, and it's always difficult when a group of new friends meet together for the first time to get acquainted. So I'm perfectly prepared to start the ball rolling. I mean, I... I have absolutely no idea what we're doing here or what I'm doing here or what this place is about, but I am determined to enjoy myself and I'm very intrigued. And, oh, my, this soup's delicious, isn't it? And all about her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, self-involved. Yeah. Andrew, thoughts on... Yeah, uh, yeah every time he, she pops up in a, in a film, you, you know, it's going to be... She's going to do a good performance. She's just one of those great comic actresses um, of the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, when I think of her, I think of uh, Private Benjamin. She's fantastic yeah. in that film. She just adds a great presence to this film. Yeah, she's just very watchable. She's always doing something in the frame. Yes, no, just what you just said. They all do something in frame. Yeah, so yeah they're exactly. all such great actors. They stay in, in character but, the whole yeah, time. Yeah, someone's off doing something. You go, oh, that's them. That's what they do. But then in today's TV, uh, movies, they wouldn't do that. No. They just, oh, oh, I'll wait for my line. It, it might sound unfair, but I don't think we've got as many great character actors now than, no. than we did back then. No. This is a showcase of those, those actors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Mm. That, yeah, and that's what I was saying earlier before, like, that helps you stay within the story, although you can see each actor's enjoying what they're doing immensely. In today's movie, when it's not about them, that scene, well, they just they turn off. They just stop. Yeah, there's the body in the background. And they're just a mate in the back. Yeah, and it's sort of not as strong. Or the other thing that'll happen in an ensemble film is you just don't see anyone else. And you get the feeling that, oh, we're going to shoot these guys all in one day and that's it. You know, these guys are all in frame all the time, whether whether they're the focus or not, and they're just chewing the scenery and having a great time. Yeah, there's some great background gags in there. Some great well. background gags. Yeah, huge ones. And then some great delayed gags, setups, and then delays as well, which is really good. Yeah. Uh, Tim Curry. Yes, the man himself, Tim Curry, who plays Wadsworth Dash Mr. Body, <laughs> <laughs> depending on which ending we're uh, we're looking at here. Tim Curry really does steal the show as the butler who bustles. The character who's the glue that keeps the story straight and the film moving briskly. His rapid-fire comedic explanation of the murders at the end highlights the movie and is the perfect wrap-up for a picture that moves lightning fast. The role of Wadsworth is actually written for actor Leonard Rossiter, but he actually passed away. And then uh, Rowan Atkinson was also considered for the role, but was rejected by the studio at the time because he was unknown in the United States at that time. He would have been great, I reckon. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, definitely. It'd It'd be a different... Film. I, I think what the great the great thing about casting Tim Curry is he brings that energy and theatrical element. Rowan Atkinson would have brought a, a more subdued performance, I think, and that those final sequences would have been. Oh, he actually would have done quite well, and the slapstick would have been very funny. Yeah, Rowan Atkinson could have worked quite well. It would here. be different. Yeah, yeah. Because it's hindsight, and now for me, Rowan Atkinson is that deadpan, dry delivery. Yeah, Mr. Bean. Back in 1985, he wasn't that yet. Yeah, on exactly. a mainstream so yeah, exactly. he has a lot of arrows in his quiver he doesn't use anymore because he doesn't have to so 
yeah, he, there's in, a big chance he would have been all right. Interestingly, though, at this point, Tim Curry had only done, he played Rooster in Annie and is phenomenal in Annie to the point where you just want more of that character in. And I think they wrote more of that character in after the fact. And he's in Legend as oh, well, right. plays Darkness in Legend. And then he did Clue. So they I mean, yeah, he still had a bigger uh, profile than I guess Ron Atkinson at this point. When was but, um, but much Rocky Horror? Rocky Horror. Oh, you're right. He'd done Rocky Horror in 75. That's amazing, isn't it? Because yeah. that was such a bravado performance. Ten years, ten years earlier. The greatest thing about the character of Rodsworth, though, is the fact that his true identity is actually completely different depending on which ending you're watching. Yeah. In ending A, he is what he says he is. That he's a real butler who is another one of Mr. Body's victims and he's also a very good amateur sleuth as well. In ending B, he's an undercover FBI agent and being a butler was his cover. And then in ending C, he really is the despicable Mr. Body pretending to be a butler. So I, I find that element of his character really interesting. Which is three which, different people. Which is presented as the real ending in the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. In the TV version or the whatever version it I is, watched, but yeah. like we'll speak about shortly about its theatrical release, um, yeah. some people didn't see that. Didn't anything. say that at so, all. I'm just what I'm saying the character of Wasworth is really interesting because he actually is like three different people. Yeah, I, I think I don't I think Tim Curry's brilliant, and I love him in this. I love him in yeah. everything. So. I think I love the the opening where uh, he arrives and immediately you start questioning because you never see a butler arrive at a house he's always exactly. in the house and it's just that that yep. creates that, set, that question mark straight away and you he's never just, really know who he is it's never really established whose house it is though is it no I don't it's think so it's just a house he's using for the purposes of this uh, this dinner and yeah. he, the, look the expressions on his face in that opening scene as well he looks a lot more menacing than he does throughout the rest of the film yeah until the end of the and uh, you'd think that maybe they'd be playing off his Rocky Horror character or something like that. Like he, you'd cast him for that reason, that there, he's, there's a sinister quality to him that uh, it makes you question. Yeah. I just figured he was coming back from errands. He's a butler. He had to do some shopping so to do anything, or he had to do the post or something. So you didn't read anything yeah. to his expression? No, my, no, my mind was just, he's a butler. It's, so. him, what about the, it's him returning rather than arriving. Yeah, yeah. yeah what about the dogs, away. though, when he feeds them the, the, the meat? So obviously the, the dogs aren't familiar with him. So that I makes you kind of... they were really good attack dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. Just dutiful. Do the, dutiful yeah. dogs. Attack yeah. dogs. Don't you? And then you never see them again. Like, once they all arrive, they disappear. You get the Doberman from the... Um, the glass. The glass house. Yep. But then when the... Yeah, those the German shepherds. And um, head of the class teacher rocks up <laughs> and um, the motorist rocks up, <laughs> those guard dogs that are right by the front door aren't there anymore. Yep. Poor form, Clue. Poor form. <laughs> <laughs> Madeline Kahn plays Mrs. White. Um, she's an alleged black widow who was drawn in to avoid a scandal regarding the mysterious death of her nuclear physicist husband. Uh, she was previously married to an illusionist who also disappeared under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> I love that line in the film. Where, like, But he was your second husband. Your first husband also disappeared. But that was his job. He was an illusionist. But he never reappeared. Uh, he wasn't a very good illusionist. <laughs> yeah, what do you guys think of uh, Madeline Kahn in this role? Uh, th- for me, there are three performances in this film. Other than Tim Curry, there are three performances, as I was talking earlier, that it's the actor's idiosyncrasies and, and little things that it just make it. And Madeline Kahn is hilarious. The, the different ways she delivers lines, the moments in the background, the different noises she's making. She's brilliant. I mean, she's, I mean, you know, she's in Blazing Saddles, she's in Young Frankenstein, and she'd worked with um, Mel Brooks, obviously, quite a lot. But she's one of the funniest women ever to appear on screen. And in this, she's, even in an ensemble, she doesn't take over, but just completely It, it, it. it makes she's you so miss funny. comedians like that these days. You yeah. just the, the female comedians of today are just a different breed. And she had this kind of uh, a, mystery. A, a and subtlety, a femininity, uh, but a very a strong. A darkness as well. And a darkness. So, yeah, I think Madeleine Kahn has a real, you know, almost like a Lucille Ball or Carol Burnett strength on screen and, and sense of humour and, and what's funny and nails every scene she's in, yeah. The classic line at the end where, you know, the whole... Yes, I did it. I killed Yvette. I hated her so much. It, it, the, it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing, breath, heaving breaths. Heaving. It's that so was funny. ad-libbed by Madeline. No, Kahn. no surprise. No that, surprise. That is just a, that's a classic. That is, that's a standout there. moment, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's, it's awesome. It I hated her so much. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone, it's just that beat where everyone just doesn't know what, where, where know, that's when, going. Kind of when everyone, everyone's got the whole like, you know, darting eyes like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wish, I kind of wish the f- whole film was like that a bit, a little bit that. looser. More of that. And yeah, it would have yeah. been a bit stronger for me. But yeah, that was a, a shining moment in the film. 
Perfect opportunity for a reference coming up here, Bruce. Uh, one of my favourite actors, uh, Christopher Lloyd, <laughs> plays uh, now, what Professor else, Plum. What else has he been in, Christopher Lloyd? Mm. Um, has he been a doctor or something in something? Or? He's, um, no. Oh, he's in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He's a judge. Uh, that's, that's what, that's what it was. He's in the Dream Team. The oh, yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, so he was. doctors there. And <laughs> One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, One yes. Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. Suburban Commando. And yes. Taxi. He was in the series Taxi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably nothing else. No, nah, really. we might have to go back a bit further, though. Oh, uh, what? No, no, no. Yeah. Back to the future. <laughs> back to the future. <laughs> Uh, Doc Brown, of course. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, boy, and sorry. there are some <laughs> beautiful Doc Brown moments in this film from his performance as well. Yeah. I just love when he's yelling for no reason. Wait a minute. Suppose that one of us is the murderer. If we split up into pairs, whichever one of us is left with a killer might get killed. And it's it's fantastic. It's great. At one point, I thought he was going to say, Marty, we got to get you back. <laughs> Nobody. Look, there's no gunshot wound. Somebody tried to grab the gun from me in the dark and the gun went off. Look, the bullet broke that vase on the mantle. Maybe he just came off the set of Back to the Future and uh, still in character a little bit. Because it was the same year, wasn't it? Though, yeah. Was one released before this, this or? Adam, I thought you'd just riff off straight away, it bang. came out uh, six months before this, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. so I thought, yeah, I thought it might have nice been touch. a bit of a homage. So Professor Plum is a psychiatrist who lost his medical license because he's had an affair with a married female patient. Uh, he now works for the United Nations World Health Organization. I love the idea that you lose your doctor's license, but then you go and work for the UN. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, a discredited doctor? You have a job. No worries. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre. Uh, I also find it kind of bizarre that you'd lose your doctor's license for having an affair with the... Well, anyway, at the start, fine. I thought for committing adultery, he did it weird. while she, they were under... So it was more of an assault than an affair. Yeah, but later it becomes an, yeah. an affair. Yeah, it is With inferred the early Telegram on. Girl, is that yeah. the one? Yeah, yep. yeah. It's yeah. inferred earlier that it was, I guess, rape taking advantage or something. Whereas later on, it yeah. definitely becomes an affair, yeah. an adulterous affair. He just, I mean, we all know he's a he's a hilarious actor at, at the right moments, but. It just is a, is a, is a moment with practically no dialogue, which is one of my favourite moments that he's in this film. Remember when um, Michael McKean, who we'll get to shortly, he plays Mr. Green, is like revealing to them about how he's a homosexual, or that he, but he can't reveal it because of his job. Yeah. And, that, and then you know, he just goes, thank you, and sits down there, Professor Plum, Professor Plum just goes, well, and gets and up. Gets up <laughs> and walks away. And he just... walks away, get out of sight of the room. Yep. <laughs> Very funny. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, we, we just spoke about him. Michael McKean plays Mr. Green, and... Uh, this is a fantastic performance. Michael McKean is amazing. And, yes. I mean, we've been watching Better Call Saul as well, and he's brilliant in Better Call Saul. Uh, at this point, Michael McKean had done Spinal... This is Spinal Tap, uh, one of the greatest comedies of all time. Just quickly on that, we will have to look at that on Real we Chat. We will be looking at This is yeah. Spinal Tap on, on Real Chat. And Michael McKean in this is perfect. Because he's one of those comedic actors, I guess, that he looks like he could play a romantic lead in a film, potentially, at this point of his career. But... He's, he never really got those roles, and his career didn't flourish till kind of the 90s when he started playing villains in films. The Brady Bunch movie comes to mind, and there are a couple others where he plays the bad guy. Whereas in this film, I don't know, he, he just is hilarious. His physicality, which you don't see a lot of from him later in his career, is yeah. brilliant. He sits on the side table and falls off it at one point, and he's oh, yeah, bumbling around and moment. slipping up. Sorry. And he even says his line is something like, um, I'm accident prone, and he says right at the start. I'm very um, accident prone. The thunder goes off, and he just throws his drink. And he gets yeah. probably some of the, what I assume are scripted, or at least he's devised during rehearsals, some of the best comedy moments in the film, hands oh, down. Yeah. And he's really funny and believable. He's, he's Physical a performance. humour as well. Like, yeah. in, in the, the last part with Wadsworth, he's like taking them all through the house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he's right around. Like, he gets dro- dropped on the ground numerous times. About, oh, you know, that moment. He was dead on the ground. And he that bit him where down. Wadsworth throws him into the toilet and then he comes out, flushes, then wipes <laughs> 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 his hands and throws Martin Mull the towel. is yeah, hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely hilarious. Yeah. No, no, I, I absolutely love his performance in this film. I like, I, I'm a big fan of Michael McKean's. So. Yeah. I love him. In yeah. Anything I've seen him in. Yeah. Martin Mull plays uh, Colonel Mustard. Yeah, Martin Mull's an interesting one for, I guess, Australian audiences. He appeared in Sabrina the Teenage Witch and he was in the Roseanne sitcom and he's obviously he's in this. Um, he was a comedian, stand up comedian, and kind of alternative stand up, kind of out there, kind of wild, kind of crazy guy. He had a show, I think, Fernwood Tonight, in 1977, which was a short lived series predating the Larry Sanders show was a fictional talk show that he hosted playing a fictional talk show host and co-starred Fred Willard, who we know from Christopher Guest Films and, and everywhere else in the world. So Martin Mull, not known that much in Australia, but quite a big comedic sensation, at least on the fringes of, of comedy in the late 70s and, and early 80s, and is brilliant as Colonel Mustard in this and kind of playing 
out of character for him. This is not a kind of character who normally plays that big militaristic kind of strong man kind of role, but yeah. he nails it. I think he's brilliant in this. He's, he's thought at first to have been blackmailed for scandalous pitches with one of Miss Scarlet's employees, but it's later revealed that he was a war profiteer who made his money from selling stolen radio components on the black market, and he now works at the Pentagon working on the private mm. fusion bomb. I would say any adult that can refer to their parents as mummy and daddy with a straight face... <laughs> <laughs> That alone yeah. is worth praise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just like at the end when it comes out that he was selling radio equipment on the black market, and I think it's Mrs. Peacock just looks at him and goes, many of our aeroplane flyers uh, died pilots. because their, air, um, their radios didn't work. Yeah. I'm like, why does a broken radio make your plane crash? <laughs> yeah, it's so dramatic. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the least things you need. What do you think of Martin Mull in this film, Andrew? Yeah, so I don't think I think he's got probably one of the least hilarious roles that yeah, it's, doesn't it's not, jump out. And he, I think he, again he comes to the fore later on when he's well, there's those moments where he's kind of applauding Wadsworth's uh, detective work, and he's kind of looking kind of you know kind of uh, he's kind of getting caught up with all the the action of the moment, uh, which is really cute. And he kind of it's the la- end of the film that he really comes yeah. out like, in the comedic moments. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wadsworth is explaining the whole situation, and he he puts starts to, He puts something together in his head, and he and he looks really proud of himself. And he like looks yeah. over at the person next to him and gives him a nod and a wink, like, yeah. like hey, how about that, huh? And he starts <laughs> he applauds Wadsworth yeah. at one point, and then <laughs> yeah, there's some nice moments later on for him. But you're right, it's very unforgiving early on for him, but he still makes it work. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie Ann Warren plays Miss Scarlet, who is a madam who operates an illegal brothel and escort service in Washington, D.C. But here's the most interesting thing about the role of Miss Scarlet, okay? For all movie fans here will be interested to hear this. According to an interview with writer Jonathan Lynn, after a screening on the 25th anniversary of the film's release, Carrie Fisher was oh, originally wow. to have been cast as Miss Scarlet until she ended up in rehab... Four days before filming started, and Leslie Ann Warren was brought in as a last-minute substitution. Wow. Hmm. So, Miss Scarlet, Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Wow, that would have been... Four up until. Four days beforehand. Wow. I guess, does that, does that make you guys look at Leslie Ann Warren any differently, or do you think that... I uh, think she's, she's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I always I loved her. Tight and did oh. well. I, yeah. well <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine anyone else... I think she nails this role. Like, I... Yeah. I like, that... She's so charismatic, isn't she? Yeah. Like she's just... Oh, every, every film she's in... And the other thing I was just thinking, she doesn't age. She's no. looked the same for like 20 years, I reckon, in every film. At some shots, she looked like Susan Sar- Sarandon. Yes, Sarandon, I've yeah. always thought that. She can also look like Julianne Moore. Yep. Yeah, she yeah. kind of sits in between. Yeah, yeah. That's not bad. Like, right. it's it's the type of girl you want to like, have a drink with. She's, you reckon you can have a, have, a, have a good drink and a good chat and laugh with her. She just looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's great in this. She, yeah, is she one of the highlight performances that you were talking about, Bruce? Or was she not? You, would, you didn't put her in that category? Uh, for me, it's yeah, Madeline Kahn, Christopher, Christopher Lloyd, Tim Curry, and Michael McKean are the four for me yeah. that, that really nail this film. Um, yeah, she's, and, but she, doesn't, she compliments and she doesn't detract, and she has some really nice moments as well, no question. So yeah. this, she's always, like, that's the thing about all of them, as I think I said. They're, they're all watchable in some way. Like, they're, they're so well cast that you know, the, the lesser roles still, still are watchable, and, and there's, there's, there's a great chemistry between everyone. So it kind yeah, of. Probably. Yeah, Martin Mullen and, um, and Leslie Ann Warren probably have the hardest work to do because they're probably the least written of the main six characters. They have some nice moments together, though. Still yeah, some really nice moments. They also share, um, partner up together when they look, search the house. I love how disappointed she is to be partnered up with him. As yeah, well. that's really funny. Yeah. I like how um, Professor Plum has the short one, but he still puts it up against... Like, the really long ones. Yeah. That was always on a cheeks, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was very funny. In regards to the supporting cast, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Colleen Camp, who plays a vet, who's only revealed in her last scene that she's uh, been putting on the accent the whole time. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's not a uh, it's not a great or overly convincing French accent, but it, it is what it is. <laughs> but I thought that's what it was meant to be as well, though. I like, think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think she plays the part. It's um, high camp. Yeah, she yeah, she plays the part really well. You know, I think, I think so? you're focusing more on her parts than the part. She's about to say that. Uh, I was going to say focusing on her parts as much as the characters yeah. focus on her parts as well. How many looks does she get um, when she's uh, so many and uh, drinks in the first? Christopher Lloyd is probably one of the greatest in terms of. Is that, is that he's constantly that? checking her out. 
out. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hilarious. Very, very. very She's funny. one of those uh, actresses in the '80s that when she pops up in a film, it's it's one of those those wonderful mo- <laughs> moments for a young man, isn't it? <laughs> like she's just a stunning. She's she was one of those classic '80s kind of bombshells. I remember watching it when I was eight, seven, eight, nine, however old I was when I first saw it. And when she dies, I kind of said. Oh, why'd you kill her? She was pretty. <laughs> now that I'm older and I understand film and story development, I now and why do you kill her? She's hot. Yeah, I'm the same. <laughs> I haven't changed. Like, oh, she's not going to be in it anymore. Yeah, no, no surprise to find out she plays a Playboy playmate in Apocalypse Now. So and all, and yeah. Mrs. Tackleberry, Police Academy uh, Two, I believe. Yeah, she pops oh, up yeah. Police Academy. Oh, no, she one. marries him in Four. That's yeah, that's that's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Very well done. Yeah. Very well. Um, also, a completely different character when she pops up in Die Hard. Die, Die Hard, Hard with a Vengeance. Vengeance. Very different character in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah, who, she's who a cop she in that, isn't she? She's a cop. Copper. Yeah, but uh, not uh, flaunting herself at all yeah. by 1995. Yeah, she's, she's been in a lot of interesting roles. She's, a, she's actually a good actress and familiar. Always in a, you yeah, always that, that, you, that, what was she in? What was she yeah, in? Yeah. Uh, the other supporting actor I want to bring up, uh, Bros, is Lee Ving. Uh, yeah, the actor who plays Mr. Body um, is the frontman of the punk rock band Fear. Uh, he uh, also shows up in uh, Sound City, the Dave Grohl documentary about the recording studio of the same name, um, and hasn't aged particularly well. But really bizarre casting. Yeah, I uh, reckon yeah. as well. He, he, he doesn't has, fit. I don't reckon. I, th- I think he's really good. I, I quite like how he's, oh. he's, he's. Well, I just find him is Mr. Body, and he's kind of he's going to be the victim and. I, I kind of like his flat kind of performance. I like it. Yeah, he's chosen. chosen because his name is Lee Ving. Uh, Mr. Body will be Lee Ving soon. Is that the only reason he I was know, chosen? That's true. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's I mean, a long stretch of a joke, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that awesome. is a lot. He, he's, he's done a fair bit of acting, too. So, he, I mean, he's equally... Well, not he's equally. Got he's got 30 credits. So he's, he's done a fair bit of acting. I, I really like him in it. What I like about him, I guess, is it's... It's always that idea of that, that all the other characters are so high camp and so overplayed, and he's so underplayed and subtle. I really like that balance. I really like that he comes in and and he can see that he's there to wreak mischief for his because he's different to everybody else. You can see that he's someone else. He's he's a different, lives a different lifestyle. He's from a different area, different socioeconomic class or something. He is a tough guy, and there's something different about him. And he I like that. He does look tough. He does look really tough. He yeah. Should have been Bill Murray, but he does look. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> just, just just the scene when he walks in, he just sits in that chair behind them all as if he doesn't really care. Yeah. And I'm Bill like, Murray would be good, wouldn't Bill he? Bill Murray would have done that. Just a like, cameo. And he could have been a real prick, Bill Murray. Like, it would have been more, a bit more subtle. A bit of Scrooged yeah, Bill Murray yeah, just, assholeness. Yeah. Or Grand Holiday. Well, wasn't day. funny at all. No. No. Yeah, see, that's the other thing. You didn't want the body to be funny. That's either, true. But yeah. I, don't, I think if it was Bill Murray, I don't think he could help but laugh at what he was doing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, too. Yeah, that's but right. I get your point, definitely. Um, one, more, one more character I want to bring up, Bruce. Uh, we have spoken in previous films, such as one ah, of the yes. films about the Interceptor being a character. And Ecto-1 it, being a character. Yeah, Ecto-1 being a character in Ghostbusters. In, in Clue, uh, the house is definitely... Oh, uh, yeah. Bring yeah. Up, without a doubt. Um, I was trying to picture the car. There's no car in Clue. <laughs> <laughs> There's, a, There's a bunch of cars. 1940s cars? Yeah. yeah, they're very nice. Is it 40s? This film set in the 40s? It's, it's, well, it's not really established, but it's post-World War II and it's Cold War, so it's... it's yeah, okay. Late 40s, early 50s. Yeah, okay. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, director Jonathan Lynn and cinematographer Victor J. Kemper keep the camera work simple but effective. He allows the house and the cast to shape the movie. His camera merely frames the moment rather than defines it. Indeed, Clue benefits from a great set and a quality cast, but the house is perfect. You're talking about a vet again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the house is perfect. It's eerie but not frightening on the outside. Something of a cartoonish, over-exaggerated, but still believable structure that especially in the dark, doesn't look like a place that would be very welcoming, particularly surrounding surrounding it with thunder and lightning as well. Very effective. Inside, though, it's dark and warm and even welcoming. Mm. Um, uh, but at the same time, mysterious and oddly dangerous. It's the kind of place that's small enough for intimacy, but big enough that it can host the players and the killings alike and hide the evil deeds within its many walls and rooms and secret passageways. Mm. Just quickly on that, bros, when I was a kid, the secret passageways were the coolest thing. They're the best oh, thing no, about the game. The best ever. I used to dream about my parents' place having secret passageways behind yeah. the fireplace and that. Yeah. Who didn't love secret passageways as a kid? Seriously. The, the, the only reason thing. I liked the TV show Webster. It had a secret it passageway. It had a secret passageway. It did. And a lazy waiter. 
Yep. See, the, I think that is the only reason you'd like anyone would like the series Webster. I think yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That was a really good tie into the game as well because the, the, the secret passage that was a key part the of the game. game yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Did, did the movie was it consistent with the rooms that they went to? I was just going to ask that question actually. Well, it was like one secret passageway throughout the house that you could take different leaves. Right. You could go different ways. Whereas yeah. in the board game, you could only go A to B. And, yeah. The endings, yeah, uh, with the three endings that they shot, and um, a different one shown at, at different theaters. I don't know if any of you guys saw this at the cinema. Probably not, based on how. No, definitely made. not. The whole idea about having different endings being sent to different cinemas. It's insane, isn't it? And it's, it's, a, it's a Hitchcockian kind of idea. The, and Hitchcock would have done that if he could have. Um, sending three different endings yeah. to all the different cinemas well, that were playing it. The great, great thing about that is if, like, let's say, uh, you and me, bros, had gone to see Clue at the cinema, but we got different endings. Yeah, we if you went to Hoyts and film, I went to Village. And I said, like, oh, can you believe Mrs. Peacock did the whole thing? And you went, uh, I no. think Miss Yvette and Miss Scarlet did the, the whole thing in the version I saw. You create all this intrigue, and then people would be going, well... How many different endings were there? Yeah. Like, you know, Unfortunately, it didn't create any of that intrigue or word of mouth. <laughs> no, it didn't. But it, yeah, it but would have been fascinating. It, in theory, it sounds like it would work pretty well. Yeah, and it's a great idea. idea. Maybe they need to shoot 10 or something. <laughs> More different endings. More different endings. But, um, 216. I do like how in all the endings, communism is just always a red herring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it is nice. It's, it's good. It's yeah. a mid-80s, Cold War, fear. Nah, it's all bullshit. Don't listen to it. Communism is a bit of a theme in that, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, There's a little bit of a political um, it, jab there. I think we've mentioned it before too, but in the 70s and 80s especially, having communism as a plot point was so convenient and easy because in America at least, that was the big evil. There was one big evil and it was communism and it was so easy to have you know Russians being converted or Russians escaping and, and, and communism. Be, whereas now with political correctness especially, it's so hard to have a big evil without having to explain in and around it. And I think that's something I always found Iron Man did very well, is that they, ha- they created their new big evil. But it's hard to have the Taliban or ISIS. or Like, it's, so, it's such a different landscape now. But, and th- this ma- obviously parodies the whole idea. Russians are coming back into the fray as villains, though. Have you noticed? It's in the last few years. There seems to be a little yeah. bit of a uh, you know, go-to culture. Just, just, just quickly on those endings as well, the uh, the the, uh, the DVD and uh, uh, American Blu-ray release as well um, gives you the option of watching, like all our video versions, watching all three of them one after the other. This is how it could have happened. This is how it could have happened, yeah. etc. It also takes advantage of the format with the whole seamless branching thing about allowing you to watch the film with a random ending as well. I like uh, that idea. I'd love to see this film with one ending. It'd be an interesting exercise in this because I've only ever seen it with the multiple endings. Yeah. 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 In some cities as well, during a statical release, uh, the newspaper print ads indicated which version was being shown at each theatre. Oh. A, B, or C. How's that? Was it done subtly or was it done no idea. Yeah. Oh, but, um, Maybe ignorantly, like they had no idea. Yeah. And they just went, oh, this is the title. Parts. I'm like, hoping some people NC. might go three times to see Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Know, but, Unfortunately, uh, none of that worked. No, no not even <laughs> remotely. Bruce, you touched upon this at the start, but why are the title and character names different from the board game? Like you said, there was a Reverend Green in the board game. It was changed to Mr. Green. Well, that, that was that were the differences between Cluedo and Clue. Right. So the movie is definitely based on the American version of the board game Clue. Yeah. So a lot of the differences are the American variations from the English version. Yep. So Mr. Body and uh, Reverend Green especially are um, American changes. They're the two that you mentioned. Yeah, Miss Scarlet was another one with a different spelling. Yeah, there's a one T in the yeah, American version, strange, huh? two T's <laughs> in. Took a T off the other one, yeah. yeah. So, uh, which again must be an American um, language difference, yeah. Yeah, and if the Revolutionary War taught us anything, Americans will do nothing. England tell them. That's right. That's, that's, exactly, that's right. exactly right. We found this land. Just look after it. No, this is ours now. <laughs> The uh, listeners can't see you doing that. Yeah, there, I know, uh, visual humour. But I just flipped Andrew off, I apologise. <laughs> so, uh, what did I do? You seem like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, go through a little bit of uh, trivia here from Clue, uh, bros. The, the parquet floor in the hall resembles the Clue game board. Yeah, I like that. That's it's really a nice. nice touch. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, the colour of each character's car is the same colour as their playing piece in the game. Yeah, we made that observation at the end of the film. kind of Because that's one thing I was thinking about. All the costumes didn't reflect their no. namesake. Yep. But, uh, yeah, the cars definitely do. And the entire house is a set, uh, except which is all at Paramount Studios, except for the ballroom, which was shot on location at a mansion in Pasadena, California. I don't know who must have been in the great ballroom. It's not featured much in the film. No, it's barely it's the in one, there. It's the one room... 
I guess other than the conservatory doesn't get doesn't get featured much, but all the other rooms get featured a lot more. Yeah. All the ones in the set. So I, yeah, I guess they just get it, got it in there because they're like, oh, well, I guess we should feature a room that's pretty. Or um, he, the guy who owns that ballroom might have been a um, sponsor or a you know someone who gave a them financer. A financer. Good chance. Wadsworth voices the object of the board game after the characters find Mr. Body dead. Wadsworth yells, We're trying to find out who killed him and where and with what. With the exception of Professor Plum, who actually wears a purple vest and suit, all the other dinner guests wear clothing colours or accents of the opposite of their respective pseudonym colours on the colour wheel. Mr. Green wears a red tie. Uh, Colonel Mustard, who was yellow in the game, uh, wears a dark red-violet suit. Mrs. White wears a black dress. Miss Scarlet, who was red, uh, wears a green dress, and Mrs. Peacock, who was blue, wears a sort of wears a dress and feather hairpiece in colours of orange and rust. Yeah, I, I find it kind of bizarre they didn't go with the colours of their namesakes. Yeah. Mrs. White is probably the only time that I the gag works because she takes her jacket off and reveals the white lining. It's right. like why would you, and she's so dark and so like the gag works there. I would have had Colonel Mustard in his in a mustard suit. Like I, w- I would have kept some of those consistent. I don't think the gag works because they enough. are kind of cartoony characters, aren't they? Yeah, so. exactly. And I and I can imagine, I can, I can imagine a colonel wearing a, a mustard suit. That, that makes sense. Like if you've mm. been in the army or the air force and the uniform kind of colours. I don't know. Some of it I just don't understand why you wouldn't just do it. But yeah, it's obviously a decision they made. Did you guys know that only Wadsworth and Yvette see the cook before she's killed? After she rings the gong for dinner, she runs to the kitchen before the characters enter the hall. Yep. Um, when she is visible to the dining room in the kitchen, Wadsworth turns his body to cover the cook just in time for Mrs. Peacock to look toward the kitchen. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, that's so, clever. A little bit of blocking sort of yeah, some uh, nice decisions stuff. there. In the US version of the board game, only Professor Plum and Colonel Mustard have any identifiable backgrounds given their titles. In the UK version, Reverend Green's profession is also apparent. All the other characters' backgrounds are left ambiguous. However, on some editions of the board game, the covers show Mrs. White dressed as a maid, which she isn't at all. Mrs. White, we had a version where she was a, sh- a cook. Yeah, a chef for a She was a cook. A... She was in white. Yeah. White. Yeah. 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 Mrs. White was a cook. And I think in the TV show, anyway, we'll get to that later, she was a cook. The three main female suspects, Peacock, uh, White, and Scarlet. Scarlet, were Academy Award nominees for Best Supporting Actress at different points in their careers. Wow. I'm not surprised. The amazing performance. Yep. Differences in two weapons in the film include that the revolver in the board game is most commonly a pepper box revolver, an early 1800s revolver with a six-bullet chamber. Um, however, it is changed to a regular 38 caliber revolver to possibly keep up with the modern time period that the film set in. The lead pipe in the game is also bent at an angle to emphasise the fact that it was possibly used in Mr. Body's murder and the film shows it as like just a completely straight, a straight pipe. pipe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Significant characters in the film that were not in the board game, uh, they're pretty obvious really, but Wadsworth, the butler, the cop, the cook, Yvette, the maid, the motorist, the evangelist, the, or the chief, and the singing telegram girl, they're all just brought in for the film, aren't they? So, yep. yep. And um, they all get killed pretty much except for the cop, I guess. The, the Sorry, the evangelist. The evangelist. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Professor Plum hypothesizes to the group that the brandy was poisoned. In the original Cluedo board game, poison was included among the possible weapons and later reintroduced for the 50th anniversary edition. There you go. That's cool. Mrs. White tells Colonel Mustard in the kitchen, flies are where men are most vulnerable. Uh, That's a great, to this great scene, gag. Prior to this scene, she ended a fight between Mustard and Mr. Body by kneeing the ladder in the groin, literally proving her point, which is mm-hmm. a nice moment. I like that tie-in. The painting behind Mr. Body's chair in the dining room depicts Mr. Body in a butler's uniform, foreshadowing the revelation in Ending C that Mr. Body was the real butler. The painting is of Lee Ving in a butler's uniform? Yeah. Oh, I didn't notice it's, that. Because it doesn't draw attention to itself. I was looking at the painting because I, I, I thought it looked a bit like Tim Curry at different times, so... Originally, there were endings in which each character killed off everyone once, and then the ending where they all did it. However, the final cut would have made the movie over two and a half hours, <laughs> um, and director Lynn thought it would be excessive, hence the three endings are in the final cut. So that's the other thing I found uh, when I watched this a couple of months ago. I found the three endings, I got a bit tired of the multiple endings, whereas last night when I watched it, I, I enjoyed that part of it. So again, when you, if you're watching on your own, I think the three different endings can get tired very quickly mm. um, because the first one is quite played out yeah. and re- re- repeats a lot of the information from the film and it takes a while for them to get edited a bit sharper the second and third could have been a bit sharper again potentially but yeah. last night I really enjoyed watching them So, and in regards to ending B where it's revealed Mrs. Peacock murders all six people 
it was revealed that Peacock is actually shot dead by the chief of police oh. when, when he confronts her at her car. Um, after saying they got uh, Mrs. Peacock when Wadsworth and the other five guests run outside, the chief then turns to Mrs. Peacock's dead body and shoots her again. This was deemed too dark. Far too dark. And Eileen Brennan recorded a new line saying that she's the senator's wife. You know, you hear her saying that off screen mm. so that Peacock is arrested instead of shot. Yeah. This is a, a good move. I think that that, Very good move. that dark move would have changed. Oh, the tone would have been way well, off. It's a bit it? like the way I reacted in Terminator because I hadn't seen the version before where he, the first Sarah Connor, he just drills bullets into her one after the other. And I found that really confronting and very violent. And again, in this instance, I would have found the same yeah. reaction because I was only used to the single bullet version in Terminator. However, yeah. part of the rejected sequence remains in the film. After the police run to Mrs. Peacock to arrest her, you can see smoke in the air from the chief's revolver <laughs> okay. as it's been recently fired. So they did film it. I didn't um, notice that, but yeah. But they've chosen not to include that on any of the... Mm. Quick turnaround on uh, moving the crew around, obviously, for that one with the smoke still in the air. So. <laughs> yeah, so... Kudos to Jonathan. Yeah. So, um, in regards to the DVD and Blu-ray releases, there was the 2000 DVD, which obviously started off this whole thing with the seamless branching, letting you choose which ending you want to see, or all of them. And then in 2012, there was a Blu-ray release, but unfortunately, bros, only in the US. Yeah, not being released here, which is really frustrating. And, and especially with the multiple endings, as we discussed, there's some great opportunities there, and... It'd be nice to get a little bit more information about this film out there, but that's just not there. And I'm sure John Landis would be... He could record a commentary yeah. for us. That'd be good, yeah. So the DVD and Blu-ray's features really just push that whole thing with the ending yeah. about how you want to watch it, and they do just get the trailer. So there's no, there's no great... There's not heaps there anyway. In fact, I'd like to know if there is any, any documentary. There's probably no there. footage. I mean, if you're a big fan, try and track down the 2012 Blu-ray from the US, <laughs> but you couldn't even find it on DVD the other day in JB Hi-Fi, could you, Andrew? I, uh, I struggled to find it anyway, yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it in my travels before, but uh, of course, when you need it, it's impossible. Andrew, let's talk about the uh, the score and soundtrack in Clue. Um, John Morris uh, is the uh, the composer. Yes. Uh, did you? Uh, yeah. What did you think? Yeah, it's difficult because it's it's a talk fest, and uh, he's really got to be subtle in, in, in his work. So it, it's not it, you don't really notice it a lot through the film. I don't think it's it, to me personally. I, I really noticed it when uh, you know there's there's some kind of shocks in in the film, dramatic shocks or suspenseful moments, and then you know the finale with Tim Curry running around explaining it. It's almost like a musical piece. It plays a lot of the comedy. Oh, very much so. The score, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it had to. I think it, it would have been really dry if it didn't have something pushing it forward. Uh, and it does a really good job. It's just a very light, you know, playful score with a bit of, you know, sinister, sinister undertones. A lot of uh, synth in there as well, uh, with, along with the orchestra, I noticed. Yeah. Yeah, a yeah. really good balance. I usually don't like um, synthesizers in, in a score with real instruments because I find them a bit jarring but he used it really well in this and to good effect and a theremin he uses a theremin a little bit throughout it really well love a good theremin yeah Yeah. yeah, good theremin's good yeah Yeah. I I think it's great Um, I'm just about to talk about the the release of it which came out only four years ago 2011 good old La La Land ah they've done it again yes La La um, do it every time (laughs) 27 track score album and it's got a lot of uh, some of the unused cues and that on there as well I I think it's great Mm. I you know, I, I, I obviously love this film. Uh, it, it takes me back there immediately when I listen to it. It, it captures it really well. I'm surprised it took this long to come out, but maybe maybe not that surprised. I mean, it, yeah. it seems that every score gets it seems to get its chance uh, to, to shine, even if it is 30, 40 years later in, in some circumstances. Yeah, definitely. It's a great listen. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, right. Would you classify it as a good listen? Or? Uh, look, it's uh, not one I'll return to too often, I don't think. I think it serves its purpose in the, in the film. Uh, but yeah, as a piece of music away from it, I, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't think too yeah. much. Yeah, I mean, I got an Albert Bernstein feel to the parts of this score as well. It had a bit of a Ghostbusters kind of throwback, which is 12 months earlier than this film. I really enjoyed some of the, the moments a lot in the film, musically. Yeah, yeah. you know how uh, back in Ghostbusters as well, bros, with Bernstein, you were saying that, like, you know, play it straight. Yeah. Clues a bit different. It doesn't always play it, it straight. It does play it for comedy at times. But it doesn't... I don't think it works against it. It doesn't undermine the comedy by any means. No. It doesn't... doesn't um, anti, uh, what do you call it? Doesn't, doesn't undermine the comedy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there are three songs in the, uh, the film, Andrew. Um, Shaboom, <laughs> uh, performed by the Crew Cuts. Um, Shake, Rattle and Roll, performed by Bill Haley and the Comets. And then, uh, as well, listen to the, here as well, bros, uh, for She's a Jolly Good Fellow, performed by Tim Curry, Madeline Kahn, Christopher Lloyd, Michael McKean, <laughs> Martin Mull, and Leslie Ann Warren, in the scene where Mrs. Peacock is leaving in the ending where she's the, the murderer. It's a very funny moment. Yeah, it's good. Very funny moment. What no, year was Shake, Rattle, and Roll released? 
Because that'll give you a good idea of what year the movie is. It's a good point. Oh, Set. look at you. Oh, hey, good detective nice work. Because I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. And then. I could beat Superman. Just putting it out there. Just Shake, out rattle, there. and roll was released in 1954. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I think it's 50s. I think that. I think yeah, yeah, I'd say 50s. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In regards to alternate versions or deleted scenes, um, you probably all wanted to know about the fourth ending. That yes, tell us about this yeah, fourth yeah, yes. ending. But subsequently dropped from the film due to the fact that director Lin did not like or approve of it. Shots of this ending are included in the movie storybook. Oh, wow. It had Wadsworth as the solo killer of the bunch, explaining that he killed everyone out of the need for perfection in the world and all of life's consistencies were not good enough. And further tells the six victims that he has poisoned the champagne he served, and unless they find an antidote in three hours, they'll die. Mm. Police show up soon enough and trap Wadsworth, but not for long. He gets away from the chief and leaves, locking all the people in the mansion. But as he steals the police car, he notices a smell, the dog-dropping smell from the beginning of the film, and realises the Doberman from earlier is now in the police car, and it lunges for him. The police car crashes and Wadsworth is dead. This implies that the others got out okay now that the windows were not guarded by the Doberman any longer. Mm, um, that's a stretch, isn't it? It's very Landis-esque, isn't it? The very Landis, it does, that's yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Mm, I don't love it, so I'm glad they cut it. Yeah. So It's almost a little bit too involved. You need everything to happen within the house, I think, in those final moments. You don't want to be taken into new locations. You don't want to be given too much information to digest. I also think the whole thing of having Wadsworth kill them all is that little bit too obvious. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I would have been disappointed with that with that ending. Not, yeah, not just same. for what it's doing. One of the things I love about the false endings yeah, yeah. are those endings where it's like, well, why don't we just don't tell anyone and we just leave here and everything's fine. Like I like those elements. There's two of the endings I think have that yeah. kind of element to it. We yeah. just stack them in the um, cellar, cellar, and walk away. Whereas that, that's, house. that's a little bit overblown though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I also like in murder mysteries like this, the sixth sense does it the best, but. Once the reveal happens, I like to know that if I was paying more attention, I could have picked it up during yeah, the movie. absolutely. So that's kind of a cop out having him leave and then kill it. Like, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, because he, at no point would you have been able to detect that he'd poisoned. Yeah, set champagne. seeds. Show me. Yeah. Don't exactly. show me it, but have six him sense in. me. Again, yeah, six cents. M night shenanigans. Yeah, give me yeah. more M night shenanigans. Good M night shenanigans. <laughs> very rare. Very rare. Uh, <laughs> Shenanigans. <laughs> Collectibles bros from Clue. I mean, this is the thing that confounded me the most, and I, I guess because... I mean, the other thing about this one we haven't really discussed, I guess it's a minor comedy for Paramount at this time. It's not a big blockbuster. It's, it's not being put out there to make millions. It would have been nice to make its budget. There is no Clue film version of the board game, which to me seems like a seems the obvious, because who wouldn't want Christopher Lloyd and, and Tim Curry, etc., on their version of Clue. I mean, it just seems... They really missed that. Part of the explanation could be that the film deal was done off the back of the old Parker Brothers Waddington's rights and Hasbro bought in around the same time, so maybe Hasbro weren't interested because they weren't getting any profit from the film. I'm not sure about the timelines there, but there's definitely some overlap between who owned the rights to the board game, and that would make sense. That's the only explanation I can come up with. But I've got some other bits and pieces and trivia about Clue and Cluedo I thought I'd just uh, go through in this, this part. I could only find four other films based on board games other than Clue or Cluedo, so I'd be happy to contribute. Battleship. The most recent is Battleship 2012. And then the other three films are all based on Hasbro's Ouija or the Ouija board game. I don't know if people realise Ouija boards was originally just a board game released by Hasbro based on, I guess, some types of occult rubbish. But Ouija boards as we know it are actually a board game. So which board in 1986, which board two in 1993, and then just Ouija in 2014 are the only other board game related films I could find which surprised me but at the same time it makes me happy because I don't think we need a monopoly mousetrap is trapped in development hill it, is it they're trying to make a mousetrap film <laughs> I long for a you know film personally uh, that, yeah, that'd be, uh, uh, draw be four <laughs> <laughs> I'm really really like, really excited for hungry hungry hippos yes. that could be a great game that, would be that could awesome. be an amazing game I'm going for the blue hippo CGI hippos imagine that yeah. <laughs> Helicopters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were two TV show adaptions of the... Actually, three TV show adaptions, sorry, of the uh, board game. There was a UK 
game show that was later adapted in Australia. We all were, Australians are familiar with Ian McFadden, um, Andrew Dado, Andrew Dado starring uh, game. Uh, so a game show, and there was an American version a year or two ago. Uh, it, was, it was a four, four or five part miniseries um, based on Clue uh, in the United States as well, which I don't know anything about and don't care for. But it was aimed at kids, so they were kind of teenaged characters and that. There was a musical and a play. The musical ran from 97 to 99 off Broadway and the play from 85 it was run in the UK in 1985 and 1990. And both had the same conceit that three audience members would be drawn from the audience and they'd choose the cards of which, you know, of the uh, location, the murderer and the weapon. They'd be put in an envelope, but that would inform the end of the play or the musical depending on what the three random cards were. And they had 216 different endings to go with the different combinations of uh, murderer, location, and weapon. We watched, yesterday, after watching Clue, we watched, there's an, uh, an episode of Psych, the American TV show called, I think it's 100 Clues, which is a tribute to Clue and includes co-stars uh, Christopher Lloyd, Martin Mull, and Leslie Ann Warren. They all show up, and it's set in a mansion, and there's a murder being solved. But it was, multiple endings as well, I hear. Uh, it does have multiple endings, and yeah. it's quite funny. It was yeah. quite funny, and some really nice references. Uh, the one plus one plus two plus one line in the uh, end of the film is That's, referenced, and a bunch of other references, which are really, really funny and really I well put I can't believe we didn't make mention of that already, that, 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 that great That is thing. so good. So... I'm afraid your moment has come. Not so fast, Miss Scarlet. I do have a secret or two. Oh, yeah, such as? The game's up, Scarlet. There are no more bullets left in that gun. Oh, come on. You don't think I'm going to fall for that old trick. It's not a trick. There was one shot at Mr. Body in the study, two for the chandelier, two at the lounge door, and one for the singing telegram. That's not six. One plus two plus two plus one. Uh Uh-uh. There was only one shot that got the chandelier. That's one plus two plus one plus one. Even if you were right, that would be one plus one plus two plus one, not one plus two plus one plus one. Okay, fine. One plus two plus one. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other thing worth mentioning just quickly is there are variations of the game Clue slash Cluedo more late 90s into the 2000s uh, that have been licensed. Um, so you can check these out uh, if, if you're so inclined. You can. There's a Simpsons version. There's a Seinfeld, Scooby-Doo, Harry Potter. Uh, there's a Family Guy version, which I think is just a less funny version of the Simpsons one. Um, <laughs> and then there's a... Shocking. <laughs> and then there's a Big Bang... There's a Big Bang Theory one where I think the object is to try and kill all the cast because they're giving you the shit. So, I'd watch that one for sure. Yeah, that'd be good. So they're all different uh, versions of the board game clue that you can pick up. Very nice, bro. Nice take on the collectible section there, bro. In regards to the uh, awards, unfortunately, bro, we've got nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. No Academy Awards or nominations, no Golden Globes nominations, not even any Satins. But it's not, it's not really sci-fi or fantasy, though, is it? Oh, it's, it's, I know, but it's a murder mystery that comedy. That hasn't uh, <laughs> stopped the satins before. before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Rotten Tomatoes website certifies Clue fresh with a score of 62%, 16 positive and 10 negative, and an IMDb score, a very nice one, bros, of 7.3 out of 10. Nice. The film was initially received with mixed reviews. Um, Janet Maslin of the New York Times wrote negatively of the film and stated that the beginning is the only part of the film that is remotely engaging. I don't know where she's coming up with that. After that, it begins to drag, apparently, she says. I don't think so at all. Roger Ebert gave the film two out of four stars in his review, writing that despite a promising cast, the film's screenplay is so very, very thin that the actors spend most of their time looking frustrated, apparently, as if they'd just been cut off right before they were about to say something interesting. Oh, okay. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what he's talking about either. And a rumoured remake has been around for a while. Yeah, thank goodness it's in development hell still. Development hell is the key thing, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, Universal Studios announced in uh, 2011 that a new film based on the game was being developed. The film was initially dropped, then resumed as Hasbro teamed up with uh, Gore Verbinski to produce and direct. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Of course, of course he's involved. Sorry. (laughs) And as of 2014, the planned remake remains, as you said, Bros, in development hell. Thank goodness for that. Do we, we don't need... Uh, we don't need We don't need Clue. We don't need Clue. I reckon it would do worse than this one did at the box office. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't know. It's a film of its time. Adam Sandler's going to get his mates into a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, then. Oh, he's already oh, yeah. He's already killed Chris Farley, so... <laughs> <laughs> So let's wrap this up with our traditional five-star review system. Andrew, thoughts and uh, review for Clue, please. Yeah. uh, Well, yeah, I I must admit, uh, it 
it's a film that I, I did like as a kid. I, I do like the genre, like the, the kind of murder mystery in a, in a mansion. I think it's a great concept. Uh, a film that uh, is quite similar is uh, The Haunted Honeymoon with Gene Wilder. I yeah. don't know if anyone's seen yeah, that. That's a good film. I love that movie. Yeah. And I think that that one just has the edge for me. I just It seems to kind of uh, be a bit more funny and, and uh, goes the distance for me. This one, yeah, I was surprised. It didn't, didn't really uh, ch- charm me or entertain me as much as I remember it doing. So some of those critics... Uh, comments kind of agree with I just find it it was a little bit dry um, a lot of talking and and uh, just yeah I, I lost my interest was lost somewhere at some point so yeah it's still you know a great cast great to see them doing their thing and it's de- definitely a film of its time you know 85 just I don't think you could make a film like this anymore and, and it certainly uh, works for its time so um, yeah I would probably give this about a 2 out of 5 I think recommend it though yeah yeah absolutely okay have a few drinks beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruce. Oh, well, I'm going to go the complete opposite of uh, Andrew. I think this is a lot of fun. I think it's a great ensemble cast. I think everyone's having a lot of fun on screen. I think the the, the script is tight, which helps right from the get go. The locations or the the set itself is absolutely gorgeous. I love this film. It's a lot of fun. It, it definitely taps into the uh, you know the, as we said earlier the idea when you're a kid you love the idea of of uh, secret passageways you love the idea of you know solving the mystery and getting excited about uh, all the different options and then they present multiple options for the ending as well which you know any film could really do any mystery could do without too much effort it gives you that choose your own adventure kind of feel which excited me as a kid so i love this film and and i love the performances i'm going to give it uh three and a half out of five i recommend watching it with like-minded people, three or four other people. Get a bit of an audience together and, and just sit back and enjoy it. Fill up on sugar or whatever your vice is and just enjoy the hell out of it. Good stuff. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Roddy? Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm a bit the same with Bruce. Just, I enjoyed it. It's got a lot of nostalgia from when I did watch it when I was younger, so that helps. I like watching the actors. You can just see in each scene they are trained in their craft they're not just funny people that decided to be on the movies one day. They put thought into each action that they do and they choose to do. It does. It feels, it feels like a well-choreographed dance at times, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But unforced, unpracticed, they just get it, they just know because they're professionals. Imagine the rehearsals for that. It would be phenomenal. I, yeah, I, I alluded to it a few times, but I, ma- I imagine that there'd be a lot of rehearsal for this, especially yeah. on that set. Yeah. Yeah. And then each take would have just looked tire- tire- tirelessly, like, easy. <laughs> effortless? Would it have looked effortless? Yeah, sure. Effortless would have been great. I'm not a wordsmith. I'm not an actor. It's okay. Um, uh, I don't know. I'd probably give it three stars. Three stars out of five? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's good fun. I tend to turn off when I watch a movie. I don't think about it too much. If I let it just tell me a story and I enjoy it, that's cool. That way, if I come across a movie that has a hole and I saw it, you've really stuffed up. This show didn't do it. I enjoyed it. Yes. Okay, so three stars and... Yeah, uh, I give it a very good out of five. A very good out of five. I think that's a recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Between the lines. Very yeah. good to be four out of five, I would have thought. <laughs> yeah. no, four out of five. I think that, uh, yeah, Clues are... It's, it's a charming little picture, in my opinion. Um, but it's a big celluloid bundle of board game energy. That's the way I yeah. come up, Clue. It's an effective... Funny, and I think humorous is a, is a key thing here as well because I generally laugh out loud at this movie every mm. time. Really nicely acted, as you said as well, Roddy. Um, and that's the, the beneficiary of great source material and very high quality production design. Definitely, yeah, production design is yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah. The cast easily, all of them fall into their role seamlessly and seem to be enjoying uh, every second of it. That's why I didn't actually agree with the uh, with the Ebert's reviews. Yeah, they all looked frustrated. I, I don't think they look frustrated mm. at all. I think if they look frustrated, it was because they were meant to look frustrated. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, it may not hold as much appeal as the board game, mainly because it's really just got limited endings and its options in comparison. So how many of the game have, gross? 216, 216 potential 216 endings. endings. Um, but it's a really wonderfully authentic and generally entertaining little slice of pop culture, I think, and it's really brought to life really well um, by Lynn and, the, uh, and all the cast. I agree. So um, four stars from me and uh, highly recommended. Yeah, Excellent. definitely. And check it out because it seems like a lot of people didn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just want to clarify. I The only reason I wouldn't give this a four-star review is that it could easily do with, I don't know, eight proper gags for gags sake belly laughs in it. 
so that if I'm not in the right mood, I'm not going to laugh at this film. If I'm in the right mood, I really will. But if it had, I don't think uh, Andrew might agree here. If it had more just solid gags for the sake of having a gag every ten minutes or so, then I think you'd roll over with it a lot more and get a lot more laugh out loud, yeah. or spend more time at the start trying to get laughs out of an audience and then going for the subtle. It is that. very subtle, though, isn't it's it? Very subtle, which uh, I didn't mind. I, I can appreciate it that it maintained that it didn't try and yeah. oversell anything to you. It was just quite straight. Yeah, but yeah, I think you're right. It just maybe just something to just kind of keep it a bit more fluid and yeah. keep you going a bit. If it had a few more of those, yeah, big laughs for me that are just for the sake of laugh, then four stars easy, three and a half because it, it's that subtlety and it's a bit like American Wheel from London. It just maintains that pace and the results are from that pace, but it, uh, it works against it potentially as well. Anyway, guys, that, uh, that wraps it up. So thanks for coming out and discussing Clue the movie with us. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm um, anyone up for a game of Clue? Board game yeah, I'm, 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 we've got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's not so keen. <laughs> It, it is missing the revolver, though, so we do have Han Solo's blaster. Yeah, we do. To make up yeah, we do make up for it. Uh, <laughs> it was Han Solo with the blaster in the cantina bar. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> uh, anyway, guys, thanks for coming out. And, no worries. Uh, we'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. See you later. Take care. Ciao. Stay in touch with us by visiting realchat.com.au. Check us out on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at Real Chat Podcast. Instagram, real underscore chat underscore podcast. And if you haven't already, catch up with past episodes and subscribe to new episodes on iTunes.